morning. <coughs> it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Louis Francis Cudi, the President-Elect of the Canadian Medical Association, to the Saskatchewan Medical Association's Representative Assembly. He's been welcomed a couple of days ago, and uh, he certainly uh, showed us his warmth, and I, I personally appreciate uh, his inclusion of my children in the ceremony last night. Uh, that was certainly uh, family-centered. Dr. Francis Goody is originally from Montreal. He received his Doctor of Philosophy in 1985 and his Doctor of Medicine in 1987 from the University of Alberta. While training as a general surgery resident, he became fascinated with the subject of injury prevention. In 1994, he completed his studies in injury while working towards a Master's of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Francis Cudi currently works as an emergency physician at the Royal Alexander Hospital and the Northeast Community Health Center in Edmonton. As a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta, Dr. Francis Cudi has taught courses in injury control, public health, and the epidemiology of injury. Over the past two and a half decades, Dr. Francis Cudi has spearheaded various public safety awareness initiatives and campaigns. For his many contributions in injury prevention, he was selected as one of Alberta's top 100 physicians, physicians of the century, by the Alberta Medical Association and was awarded the Alberta Centennial Medal from the Government of Alberta in 2005. He is the founder of the Coalition for Cell Phone Free Driving and former director of the Alberta Centre for Injury Control Research. In 2010, he became president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Louis Francis Cudi. So uh, the mic's going to go on in a second, and what I'd like to do is, uh, this is my debut presentation, so I've got to be very careful because Martin's here from the CMA. So if, uh, if things go awry, please try and work it out between Martin and I. <laughs> if everything works well, then Martin will take credit, but if everything goes bad, then I'll, uh, I'll assume the credit for that. What, what I'd like to do is build on the theme that we've heard the previous speakers develop over the last day and a half. And uh, maybe fill in some gaps, try and give you a little bit of a road map that uh, we can develop a common language across the country as physicians. So by the end of the presentation, I want to leave enough time that we can engage in questions. Because I noticed yesterday, this is an audience that likes to engage in questions, which is very different than most physician audiences. Most physician audiences are quite reserved, but this one seems to want to get engaged. And I think that it's uh, an honor to I'll do my first official presentation on behalf of Anna, and I couldn't make it today, and, and try and set the stage as to what the CMA is thinking and how the CMA wants to build on the expertise at our provincial and territorial, territorial medical association so that we can develop a unified <coughs> voice across the country. So what I'm going to do is develop three themes, and within three themes, three sub-themes, and I'll give you a map. And the map's kind of small, but you'll see it highlighted in red so you know when we're getting towards the end. So if I do this correctly, we should get towards the end in about 15, 20 minutes, and then hopefully that'll leave five or you know, seven minutes for a discussion back and forth. Does that work for you? Okay. Now I've got some slides in there that, uh, that test the audience. These are slides that I use all over the place. I have the opportunity to do a lot of presentations. And depending on how you respond to the slides, I'll, I'll know how far to push it. So if there's some slides that look out of place, they're just test slides to see where you are on the curve of normal human beings. And then I'm going to give you a test at the very end that no one has ever been able to pass. I've, I've done this presentation, not this one, but I've used those slides around the world and I've never met an audience of humans that have ever been able to pass this test. So I'm, I'm telling you right now that I'm going to ask you to do a test that you're going to fail. Are you ready for that one too? All right, so let's get started. So, these slides here represent the continuum of life, a 
okay? So from the time we're born to the time we enter into our learning stages and then the time we enter into work, which is where we spend most of our time to, our, our senior years, physicians are in contact with humans all the time. So what I'd like to do is really find out what's in your mind, all right? I need to know what's on your mind right now, because you're probably sitting here going, okay, here's another presentation, what am I gonna get out of this? You know, who is this crazy guy trying to push the boundaries? Who is this guy that's sort of challenging our thinking? So what do you want to hear? I just want to know what's on your mind before I say anything else. What do you want to hear? Well, what this seems that I can use when I go back to my practice. Okay. What I can use when I go back to my practice. Dr. Doig, what do you want to hear? This is like medical school. Yeah, exactly. Remember, like you're, you're in medical school. Well, nowadays, medical school, nobody's looking at you. They all got their computers open, and they're all typing and doing their Facebook and all the rest of it. <laughs> Yeah. What I hope is that the proceedings of this meeting are giving our board and our senior leadership some ideas about where the profession needs to go. Congress are giving the profession some ideas about what it needs to do to go back to its Okay. So, building on your theme, what can you take back home? You're saying that uh, not only the board, but the CEOs that are here and maybe the regulatory authorities listen to what physician members are saying and then interpret that information and then give it back so that you can actually start building on it. Is that correct? And I think we'll be able to do that. What, what do you want to hear, my old friend Ram? Yeah, I'd like to know where the uh, physician leadership is at the national level. <laughs> so where is the physician leadership at the national level? And where is the speaker? What does the speaker want? That's what you would expect from a speaker, right? <laughs> Dr. Barrett, what do you want to hear? <laughs> okay, so we're moving on and we're in good shape. I think we're going to be able to do that. Now, before we start, most people have no conflicts to declare. I've got lots of conflicts to declare. So I work as an emergency physician in one of the busiest emergency departments in Western Canada. And so as someone mentioned yesterday, if you want to find out how things are not working, just go to your local emergency department. And so I've got the biases of thinking the system probably is in worse shape than it actually really is. Unfortunately, right now, I've got two very close loved ones that uh, are in palliative care. And the reason they're in palliative care is because of misdiagnosis. So on a personal note, I've got my mother and my mother-in-law that are dying because of this uh, colon cancers. And so I'm glad to see the booth out there on screening for colon cancers. The other thing is, as past president of the Royal College, I've developed some biases there. Sitting on the regulatory authority in Alberta, I've developed biases there. Sitting on the Board of Governors at the University of Alberta, I've developed biases. And sitting on the Accreditation Canada Board, I've developed biases, all right? And so I'm gonna try and keep those biases in check. But we all have biases, and I think it's wrong for us to try and pretend that we don't have biases, all right? So I've got more than enough biases. But the most important thing is, if I've got an audience, I've got to know who's in that audience. And I'll bet you we've got somebody from the silent generation here, do we? Who was born between 25 and 45? Yeah, sure. Or you're even before that. Yeah, yeah. When were you born? 23. 23. I'll have to redo my slide. <laughs> That's the first time my slide has not been up to date. And I don't even know what they would call that generation. How many are from 25 to 45? Put up your hand. Okay, you're the silent generation. What about baby boomers, 46 to 65? A lot of baby boomers. What about uh, Generation X, 66 to 82? We've got Xers. My favorite generation is Generation Y, 83 to 94. Have we got some? Good, we've got some of those. And Generation Ad, I don't expect we've got too many of those. Right? So when I came here, Martin said, you know, you're going to Saskatchewan. I know Saskatchewan very well, so you better be very prepared because they're going to try and do whatever they can to make sure that you know what you're talking about. So I had one of my graduate students prep me, and uh, he was asking me all sorts of questions. And he said, well, doctor, if you go to Saskatchewan and they ask me why is Generation Y called Generation Y? I said, well, that's a very good question. I don't think I have the answer. And they said, well, you better find out, because that's probably what they're gonna ask you. So I did my research, 
And do you know why Generation Y is called Generation Y? Yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> this is why generation wise is the generation. <laughs> so you passed the test. That's one of those test slides. If you laugh, then I know I can push it a little. Bit. If you didn't laugh, then I would have been kind of kind of kind of hard pressed to destroy the next one. So being a professor at the university, there's got to be a learning objective for every presentation. The only thing that I want you to remember, the only thing that I want you to remember from this presentation is that this is an opportune time for our profession to really shine. All right? That's the only thing that I want you to remember, that this is the time for us as a profession across the country to really make a difference. The timing has never been better. And the last slide kind of leaves you on a, on a note of caution, because the fellow that said these words uh, is someone that's very well respected. And I'll show you why we have an opportunity to shine, but we also have an opportunity to fall flat on our faces. All right? So let's start building this, this theme. So the first theme is healthcare th transformation. We've heard enough about that. We're not going to spend too much time developing that theme further. I'll just sort of fill in a couple of gaps that I thought um, weren't spoken about. And then I'm going to talk about health equity. And that's one that I really have not heard too much about that really needs to be addressed, and this is something that the CMA is quite passionate about right now. And the last one is the advocacy role, especially of the CMA and provincial associations as well. Okay? So we'll develop each of these themes one at a time, very quickly, mostly visually, and then I'm gonna stop talking, and then we're gonna take some questions. And so by the end of it all, I'll just repeat again, the learning objective is that you leave feeling that you can make a real big difference as an individual. And as an organization, I think you're poised in this province to actually lead the way, right? You're small enough, but you're big enough. You've got the economy on the go. You've got a mix of everything you pretty well need. You've got urban, you've got rural, you've got <coughs> Aboriginal. You've got things that are really representative of Canada in this province. And you've got a great relationship with your ministry, all right? So you've got something here that we can sort of steal from you and with the CMA take this idea that's developing in, in Saskatchewan and then bring it to our next presentation. So the next presentation I get a chance to do is in Newfoundland and the one after that's Prince Edward Island. So I'd love to be able to leave here and having you give Martin and I feedback as to are we on track, are we off track, what can we add so that the next time we do this presentation it's powerful and we can say Saskatchewan added to this vision. And then we'll add the vision of other provinces so that we can fill a gap at the very end that we're gonna talk about. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit and I'm gonna try and talk about ultimate responsibility. There's some slides that are terrible, but when you see a terrible injury like this, somebody at the end of the day has to take responsibility. And that's what we do. That's the unique role of physicians. We're not afraid to take responsibility. With all due respects to the other professions, I don't think there's too many of them that would take responsibility for a patient like this. But we take responsibility, whether we're surgeons, whether we're emerge physicians, whether we're anesthetists, whether we're physiatrists, it doesn't matter. We don't turn away from patients because we have to make the case, what's the proposition value of physicians? Everybody wants to do what physicians are doing now. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but we better be prepared to say, what's the value we bring to the system? And I think the value we bring to the system is, we're not afraid to take responsibility for our patients. We're not afraid to take responsibility for things that are complicated, for things that don't work well. That's what we do. That's what we're trained to do, all right? So we take responsibility. That's very important to remember. The one thing that we don't do, the one thing that we don't do, I don't know why, but we never talk about loving the systems we work in. How many of you love the system you work in? So we got maybe two people. I love the system I work in. I'm getting to love the big system. Like we've got buttons at our place that says, Alberta Health Service Resistance is futile. You know, it's such a big organization, 100,000 employees that we're just starting to get to like it. But we all love, most of us love the little organizations that we work with. 
So the point is, for our junior colleagues, our medical students and residents, what do they hear? What do they mostly hear on the ward? They hear us as senior physicians lamenting the system. Those dumb CEOs, those dumb managers, what a mess up, what a F up, what a this up, what a that up, I'm so sick and tired, I need good old days. How are they supposed to develop a love for the system that they work in? You know, we're extremely well trained to take care of our patients. We're extremely well prepared to meet the needs of the patient. But nobody prepares us to meet the needs of the system. And so what ends up happening is we raise a generation of learners that grow to hate these systems because they see their staff people sort of saying, well, I don't like this system. Right? So what, what's the role for us? Well, you've got to remember the most important thing we do is we set the tone. We set the tone. So when you leave here today, and I'll keep, I'll, I'll keep addressing you because you wanted to get some tips as to what you can do. So when you go back, you have to set the tone. Because if you set the tone that you don't like the system, the system sucks, the system's not working, the system's broken, the system needs more money, what's going to happen? Everyone's going to pick up on that tone, right? So you accept responsibility for the patient, no matter how complicated it is, and you set the tone for the system. And, and it's very difficult for guys to say the word love, right? I don't know why. But we've got to start learning to say we love these systems we work because they provide for us and they provide for our patients, right? They're expensive. Somebody has to take care of them. So let's step up and say we're the ones that love these systems. And if they don't work, then make them work. If you're in a relationship that doesn't work, what do you do? You either walk away or you work hard to make it work, right? But you got to stop bitching about the system. Sorry if I'm a little loose with my terms, but start stop whining, right? Start doing something. The other thing is excellence in care and quality. Now, this excellence in care and quality is probably best exemplified in the operating room, right? Because it's a very complex, very complicated system. And so if we are going to be the agents of change, and they're asking you to be the agents of change, then you have to have a blueprint as to what you're going to do to make the difference, right? And so if we're going to be the agents of change, then I've narrowed it down to three things. And I'll leave these articles. It's just timely that uh, I just wrote these two articles. One in Comenta Quarterly, and it's entitled, Physician Disengagement, Can It Be Reversed? And the, uh, the theory of this article is, yes, you can get physicians engaged if you have three elements. And the first element is excellence in governance. And we do not have excellence in governance in our organizations right now. It takes me about 27 minutes to go into an organization and just watch what's going on to tell you if that organization, A, understands what governance is, and B, is practicing excellence in governance. Right? If you don't have the governance straight, <laughs> nothing else will follow. Nothing. If you do not have the governance straight within the organization from the board level to all your supervisory level to your department level, Nothing else is going to work. Accountability, we're not really accountable, right? I can do whatever the heck I want in an emergency, and unless I really screw up and kill people on a regular basis, I never get feedback, right? I get the occasional nice letter, but uh, I, I get the occasional, you know, why can't you help my child with their psychiatric issues? But by and large, we get very little feedback. It's the only industry probably that spends so little amount of time giving feedback to people that are working within the system. And physicians love that feedback. We're all sort of type A, high expectation, want to be the best we possibly can be. And if we're starting to give feedback to us in such a way that's meant to be instructional, we'll accept that feedback. We'll accept that accountability. We'll accept our outcome measures. But nobody's really engaging us in that. And when they do suggest it, we feel very defensive, right? We feel very defensive. But the last thing that we really need to know how to do that we don't know how to do is have crucial conversations. We as physicians think we have difficult conversations when we tell someone they have cancer or they've just had a big heart attack, but we don't have the skill sets that are required to have those truly difficult conversations with each other. And if, we, and if we don't have those skill sets, what ends up happening is, when it's time to have one of those difficult conversations, what do we do as humans? If we're about to engage in a difficult conversation, and we don't know what skills are required to engage in it, 
the first reaction is you'll either become very defensive, the hair on your back will go up and you'll lash back at it, right? Or the other one is you'll freeze, you'll just stop. Animals do that. When animals are startled or, or feel threatened, what do they do? They stop. They try and camouflage within their environment. Or the last one is you'll just walk away and not engage in the conversation. Could you put that in a real world context? You know, what conversation are you talking about with your colleagues, with your, uh, with your administration? I, I'm yeah, so let's say you have a problem with drinking. Yeah. Heaven forbid you do. But let's say you have a problem with drinking <laughs> and you come to work every day and I smell alcohol on your breath, right? And, and your performance is now being impeded. Everybody knows about it. But very few people will sort of take you aside and have that conversation that they need to have. What, what practice is that? Okay, so you're a family physician, and uh, you're the family physician that just so happened to miss that rectal bleeding in my mom. And not only my mom, but his mom, and his mom, and his mom, and his mom. So who's gonna have that difficult conversation with you? So your administrator comes to you and uh, tells you that we've got a problem with the finances. Are you, are you prepared to have that difficult conversation? So there's training that you can get on how to have that conversation. Because most of the time, we waste so much time in conflict because we don't know how to have those difficult conversations. Right? And so organizations that I've seen that have had training in this are high-performing organizations because there's nothing you cannot talk about. Because they've got the skill sets to have that conversation. And the operating room is probably the best environment. And in the UK, they have a whole artificial lab in the UK where they measure teams and they have, uh, they've created an artificial environment, and uh, Aidan uh, Pelligan is the fellow that runs it, and they'll videotape everything within a simulated OR environment, and they have another team of anesthetists, OR nurses, and surgeons critique the team. And so, you've just watched this team perform a laparoscopic polycystectomy. How do you think they did? Oh, okay, yeah, they did well. How did the nurses do? They did very, very well. How did, how did the uh, surgeon himself leave the team? Oh, they did very well, okay. Mics are still running, cameras are still running. They go out into the hallway, and in the hallway they go, what an asshole, I wouldn't let him operate on my sick dog. Did you see that there? She didn't know a retractor from a, a, a protractor. You know, those people, I can't believe Leeds lets those people operate. So, in the formal setting, they'll say the nice things. In the informal setting, that's where the truth comes out. Right? So who does that help? That doesn't help anyone. And so when people start actually studying this, they're starting to find out that crucial conversations is one thing we don't even know about. We don't even teach in medical school. And so how do the medical students and how do our junior colleagues learn? They learn from modeling after how we do. Now, <clears throat> on, on a scale of 1 to 10, is this too negative? Like, do you want it more sunny, more positive, more... Like, I, I just want to get the tone. Is this okay, or is this, like, too... Is it okay? Okay, if I get, like, too... Mark, give me a signal. We'll go like this, or... Or remind me that I'm just president-elect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, income gaps. The only thing I want to tell you about income gaps is this book right here. How many of you have heard of The Spirit Love? Okay. Now... If you've never read this book, read it. And then after you've read it, read it again, and then share it widely. All right? Because if we believe what's in this book, and we work as a profession to try and put some of this into play, we'll have more impact on helping our patients' lives than anything else we can do. Okay? This basically says that right now, if you measure the spread between the haves and the have-nots, it's getting wider. And there's a very big difference. Where are the haves? Okay? We're the next. If you're a physician, you're in the top probably 0.5%, top 2% of earners in the country. All right? So we are the haves. Right? We are the haves. It's up to us to make absolutely sure we're aware of the consequences of the gap between us and the person that cleans the floor in your institution. Okay? There are health gaps there. Somebody has to talk about it. The other one is, what is health? Well, Let's start from the very beginning. This is the earliest picture my parents have of me. I don't know how the hell they got it, but they said, Louis, Luigi, this is you as a bambino. <laughs> and so, if you're born, most of the time everything works out perfectly well. Not always, not always, but most of the time you go from two half cells to, I don't know how many, billions of cells in nine months, and things work, right? But then it's what happens after that. 
If we don't focus on the first 18 months of life when the child's brain is most malleable, that's where a lot of disease that we're seeing today was started, in the first 18 months of life. The most crucial developmental time for a child, other than being in utero, because if a woman's under stress when she's pregnant, then genes can actually be turned on and off. You've heard of epigenetics, epigenesis. So if this woman is pregnant and she's in a stressful environment at home, genes actually get turned on and off in her fetus that are then passed on to the next child, if that child has kids, all right? So we know that the importance of early childhood development is paramount, and yet is this a priority for our regional health authorities? Is the most important person within the regional health authority a pregnant woman or someone within the first 18 months of life? So your choice is you either spend the money early on or you're gonna spend it later on. You have no options. If you don't spend the money early in early childhood development, you're gonna miss it. And Prince Albert's doing an enormous amount of work in this area, you may not even know about it, but the Justice Department in this province is leading the world in terms of identifying folks at very high risk. So there's a lot of good stuff going on. Now, the healthcare system here, you know, unfortunately, the public believes that it's the healthcare system that makes you healthy. Yet the healthcare system, according to Senator Keon's report that came out in June 2009, shows that health care may contribute 25% to your health. 75% of your health is determined by the social determinants of health. And that's why Sir Michael Marmot came to uh, General, uh, General Council last year in Yellowknife and pushed this. But yet this is not sticking with physicians, all right? This is not sticking with physicians. And the reason it is, it's poorly taught in medical school, and we're so, I won't say addicted, but we're kind of addicted to treatment, that this stuff is, you know, this is kind of soft and fuzzy. Well, this soft and fuzzy stuff accounts for 80% of an individual's health. So we better do a better job in teaching it. Two slides, the second one may offend some people, I apologize if it does, but I just want to make a point here. For millions of years, we were hunter-gatherers, constantly on the move, constantly alert, constantly vigil, and constantly in pretty good shape. We, we now pay fortunes to go to a gym to look like this guy, right? So in the last 27 years, we've gone from this to this. And the brain is kind of confused. The brain is going, what the heck is going on? You know, you must be a great white hunter because there's no need to go hunting anymore. You got enough reserves here. It's time to hibernate, right? And this is screwing up our mind. I, I gave a talk in Manitoba to 120 psychiatrists and I floated this theory and I didn't get left out of the room. And there's evidence that's starting to show this is not good for your brain, all right? It's not good for your brain. This is good for you. So or do you know all the superfoods? Do you counsel your patients on all the superfoods? These are superfoods. These are foods that these are foods that are miraculous. The things that they do is unheard of. Yet do we push this on ourselves and our families and on our patients? No. Do we keep track of the scorecard? These are the numbers you need to know. Each and every one of your patients, I don't care what discipline you're in, this is the scorecard. You've got e-health. E-health, as soon as it brings up the patient's report, should have these numbers there and forces you to check. Are you cognizant of how important these measurements are in each and every one of your patients? Right? And, and for those of you that are busy writing, I'll just give this slide presentation to you and you can use it in whatever way you want. Okay? Let's, let's simplify illness. You know, there's actual doctors actually starting to write about the concept that we can actually end illness. This is one of the best written books on, on this topic, The End of Illness, where, where David actually makes the case quite succinctly that we as a profession should be looking at not putting the patients at the center of care, but I get in trouble every time I use this and, and, and I'll use it with caution. We should be looking at getting rid of the patients. And I'm not talking killing you. I'm talking, we should be looking at understanding the concept that as physicians in 2013, we have enough evidence to know how to get rid of patients. I've yet to meet a patient that appreciates their colorectal cancer. I've yet to meet a woman that says, oh, I'm so happy I've got breast cancer. I've yet to meet someone with mental illness that wants it. I've yet to meet a traumatized teenager that says, oh, this is great. Yeah, go ahead, take both legs off. My point is, patients don't want to be patients. And if they do, there's probably a reason for that, right? Patients don't want to be patients. So as a profession, what we have to do is step back and say, hey, you know what? Maybe it's time for us to really shine and take this discussion to an entirely different level. Will you be uncomfortable? Absolutely. 
Humans are designed to feel negative about everything they hear. So 70% of your feelings to this presentation right now are negative. That's just, the way, that's just the way you react to it. That's how you survived as a species. You're very untrustworthy. You're, 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 you don't trust me because you don't know me, right? And, and you're going, what the heck's this guy coming here and talking to us about? This sounds very suspicious. This sounds threatening. But the point is that there's people that understand the notion that we can simplify this disease process in front of us. How many of you have ever heard the three for 50 concept? Well, it's very simple. So you meet someone in an elevator and you want to tell them that your new mission is to, you know, reduce the needs of patients being patients. Well, you just being patients. Well, you just remember that three risk factors, smoking, inactivity, poor nutrition, contribute to four major diseases, certain cancers, diabetes, chronic pulmonary, and chronic respiratory. And those four conditions account for 50% of the disease burden. If you're a CEO, 50% of your costs are going through to three risk factors. And so each and every time that you meet a patient, are you aware of those risk factors and do you do something about it? You see how simple it gets when you actually start understanding the science behind this? Where are our junior learners? Uh, how many of the junior learners are here? Put up your hands. So uh, do they spend a lot of time in school teaching you about this stuff? I'm talking like at least 30% of the curriculum. No, what a coincidence. What a coincidence that we're chasing our tail, right? So is it, is it amazing why people like this stuff? Well, people like these things because they make you feel good. All those things immediately make you feel good. The brain gets a release of endorphins when you eat fat, salt, when you're having sex, sugar, inactivity. And those are the very things that, look at this, what a coincidence. Those things, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, injuries, overdose, addiction, the list goes on. That's why we need a healthcare system. So we've got to think very, very different. Now, this healthcare system is not cheap. If you take the US and Canada and put it together, we're spending every year $2.8 trillion. $220 billion of it is Canadian. The rest is mostly US. And when you take a look at those costs, 35% of those dollars are totally wasted. It's the equivalent of about four times health care in our country every year. So about 800, let's say it's 750, throw that up to 800 billion, what's, what's a couple of billion when you're from Alberta and Saskatchewan? Right? <laughs> but the whole point is that there is, there is unnecessary service, inefficient delivery, excessive administration, mostly in the US, inflated prices, prevention failures, and fraud, and that's costing our health care systems an enormous amount. It's not that we don't have enough money in the system, it's that the money is not being used as efficiently as the money should be used, all right? So what are the, what are the three things as we're wrapping down that I, I want you not to forget about? Fatigue. Fatigue is costing your patients an enormous amount of disease burden, not only in injuries, but in reduced immune systems, in depression, and a whole host of stuff. Make sure your patients are sleeping. Make sure you're sleeping, okay? One of the most unrecognized public health problems today. The other one is substance abuse. Do you know anyone that has a substance abuse problem? Put up your hand. I mean, do you think we have a problem with substance abuse within our society? And the question is, why are people not happy? Right? That's the real question that nobody asks. And this one, man, you gotta relabel this one. Don't don't talk about this one, because this one, I actually try and soften it up. I don't call it mental illness, I call it brain health. The senior psychiatrist said, Doc, use brain health, it's a little softer. This is a major problem. In Alberta, suicide is the leading cause of death due to injury. More Albertans kill themselves and die in car crashes. Suicide is a major problem. How many of you know someone who's committed suicide or attempted suicide? Put up your hand. Yeah. Major, major problem. So let's talk about national voice. I left this blue because that's the colors of the CMA. This is what the CMA is doing. The CMA is trying to engage Canadians in a discussion. We've had a series of town hall meetings. The last one was in Calgary. They started off in Winnipeg. There's another one coming up in Montreal. To see what citizens are saying. And citizens are pretty well echoing what I've tried to capture here today. They're looking to the medical profession to stand up and shine. They're looking to the medical profession to say, help us. Help us as we move forward. And that's what the CMA is about. The CMA is about working with provincial associations like this one that's very strong, and learning from you, and then taking this message to the next association. 
So eventually, if we can make the CMA a very strong national voice, it'll fill this gap. And this gap that needs to be filled is right now, because the feds have walked away from this portfolio. The federal government pretty well washed its hands of health. It doesn't want anything to do with it. Yet, the feds run probably one of the largest healthcare systems in the country. The feds are responsible for Aboriginal health, RCMP, military, Department of National Defense, the correction system. That's a pretty big healthcare system. Yet they've walked away from responsibilities at a federal level. That's where the CMA, with the strength of the provincial associations, can fill that gap. Now I want to end with, I want to end with the worst is to come. Because when I hear this next individual say these words, I think that's the warning shot that has been fired across our bow, our bow, and that we better wake up. This is the, His Excellency, the Governor General of Canada, at the convocation speech last October for the Royal College. And, and I put it word for word. I didn't change anything. I'm going to read them to you because I think it makes it crystal clear. The Governor General says, Why do I insist on provoking Canadian medical professionals to carefully scrutinize your understanding of professionalism and ensure healthcare providers demonstrate the highest level of professionalism every day of their working lives. Because you are part of a social contract with Canadians. Three more. This contract is founded on three elements. Specialized knowledge that is taught formally and under supervision. The right granted to you by the state to control standards and competency. And a responsibility to society that obligates you to serve the public good. This contract gives medical professionals in our country a monopoly. In return, you are duty bound to serve your patients competently, improve the practice of health care, and enhance the common good. That's the deal. What happens if you fail to meet the obligations under the social contract? Canadians will change that contract and redefine professionalism for you. Regulations and changes will be forced upon you, quite possibly in forms that diminish or remove your self-regulatory privilege. And the last one, is one of the best ways for you and for men and women in any profession to avoid having, having change forced upon you is to relentlessly embrace new ideas, tenaciously set and reach new higher standards, and most importantly, passionately strive to ensure your profession serves the public good. The Surgeon General says he's not happy what he's seeing, he's hearing the public's not happy with what we're doing, and he's saying basically we've been given a monopoly and if we don't live up to our end of the social contract, that will be changed. And I think we're starting to see that. I think we're starting to see governments prepared to challenge the profession and say, too many promises that have been broken, we're changing the rules. And that's why you're a beacon of hope. The relationship that you have, the language that I'm hearing being discussed at this forum, I know there's 2,000 other physicians out there, but what you can do is make absolutely sure you go out and talk to at least five or six others and get them on board. Once you're all on board, the rest of the country is going to say, what the heck's going on in Saskatchewan? But we better follow suit because Saskatchewan could deliver care at a fraction of the cost of any other place in the country. And not only that, they've reduced the need for care in the first place. What are they doing in Saskatchewan? That's the words you want to hear across the country. What are they doing in Saskatchewan? All right? Now, here's your test. You ready to fail? <laughs> this leaves you on a good note, because that note before was a little too sad. This is on purpose to leave you on a good note. You're very smart. I'm going to ask you to do one thing and only one thing. And then if you do that correctly, I'll give you the next test that you're going to fail. Are you ready? Okay. Why don't you clap your hands real loud just once? Okay. Now, why don't you look at the person next to you and smile right in the eyes? <laughs> right in the eyes and smile. Come on. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Well, you failed. What did I say? Look at the person and smile. Did I say anything about feel good, laugh, carry on, have a conversation? No. And the reason is the moment you smile, what happens? You feel good. You can't help it. Women, that's how you fall in love. That's why women guard their smiles. 
you never see a woman walk by a construction site with all these guys and go. Because she knows what happens when you smile. And that's why if you're foolish enough on an airplane, when that little kid looks up over the seat, if you're a fool and you go, and that kid gets that first hit up, what the heck was that? That felt good. I want to do that for the rest of this 13-hour trip. <laughs> so when you wanted to know about the difficult conversations, the most important tool you can use is that smile. It diffuses anyone. If they don't diffuse with a smile, there's issues you've got to talk about. All right, so let me leave you with, let me leave you with this last note. Being a physician is one of the greatest honors societies can bestow on an individual. Please don't waste it. Thank you very much.